Hello and welcome to Get Good, the Beginner's Fighting Game presentation. What follows is a reproduction of a lecture that was hosted on the campus of The Ohio State University. Unfortunately, though the lecture was recorded, the recording had some audio problems which rendered it unsuitable for upload. As a result, I will be reproducing the lecture by simply reading through the slides and my notes once again in order to have something to upload for the people who could not make the time the lecture was originally planned for. This presentation will begin assuming you have hardly, if at all, touched any fighting game before. Though some of you will have probably come here seeking more advanced direction, I assure you we will get there by the end of the slide set. This presentation focuses on Street Fighter 4 for several reasons. First and foremost, the community for the game is currently very alive across several platforms. Second, any character you could care to choose has been exhaustively documented already, with many having bare basics guides available on YouTube. Third, the speed of the game is slow enough to make it ideal for learning and comprehending, without being wholly devoid of aggression and faster pace at higher levels. If at any time you have any questions, please direct them to the YouTube comments or message the account hosting this video directly, and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. If at any time you also feel that the what is on the screen is beneath you, in the YouTube description we will have links and timestamps for moving forward in the presentation to topics that interest you or just to move forward from the slide that is currently on screen since you do not need to learn about it. Also in the description we will have links to resources, sources for all of the images and links used in this presentation, and a link to the slide set itself if you wish to peruse through it more slowly. These are some basic terms you'll run into in Street Fighter 4 describing the buttons. You might hear a special referred to as the jab version or fierce version. Those mean the special being performed with the light punch and heavy punch, respectively, as most will behave differently based on the strength of the button that you use. It's a matter of preference how you refer to the buttons as the left or right sides of the slide, and they're included here just to get you used to them in case they're used. Next, let's go over some common inputs you'll see in this game. New players are sometimes confused by some of the notation of the joystick motions and have difficulty reasoning out how best to do them. Unfortunately, unlike in the lecture, I do not have a chalkboard available to me, but I will do my best to describe the motions. Of note is the Shoryuken motion. This is also noted as forward, down, and down forward arrows in some games. In Street Fighter 4, you also have access to a shortcut Simply hold down forward, go to down, and then back to down forward. The game will register this as a Shoryuken input, making it easier for new players to not fail the input. Similarly, the 360 motion also has a shortcut. Instead of completing the full circle, you can start it forward and then go back around and stop at up back, which would be a 235 degree spin instead of a 360 if you will, and get this special move to come out. In the case of some super and ultra combos which use two 360 motions, you can only shortcut the second 360. The first 360 must be a complete spin. Next, the mash or 100 hand slap, or lightning legs input. In the character's input list, you'll see a punch or a kick symbol followed by the symbol on the slide. What the game is looking for is any of those types of buttons to be pressed five times in rapid succession. So for E Honda's 100 hand slap, any combination of five punches. The version of the move that comes out depends on the fifth button pressed. So if the fifth button pressed is jab, it will be the light version, medium if strong and heavy if fierce. EX versions are performed by pressing two different buttons simultaneously for the fifth input. Doing this well normally calls for a skill known as pianoing. It is very specialized and is one of the few things I will not cover in this presentation, but guides for it are readily available on YouTube. Finally, at the bottom are charge motions. Charge motions call for you to hold down or back or down and back for a small time and then do the motion requested. For example, hold back for a short time, then move to forwards and push a button. The most confusing of these is the delta motion on the right. For this, the motion is charge down back, slide along the bottom to down forward, then go back to down back the same way, and then go across the center to up forward. Don't worry, this motion is usually completely reserved for supers and ultras. Usually you will see the motions shown this way in Street Fighter 4. In other resources online, 
they might be shown as the input as a series of arrows, or sometimes even as a series of numbers, intended to be read like the numpad on a keyboard. For example, the quarter circle forward input here will be noted as 2, 3, 6. This practice is usually most common in games such as Blaze Blue and Guilty Gear, however. Finally, of extra note here are command normals. Some characters can push a single direction in a button and get a different normal move than they would normally. A good example would be Cody. Cody has a normal standing medium punch if you just push the button. However, if you hold back and push medium punch, he performs a different move. And if you hold forward and push medium punch, you get yet another different move. If your character has command normals, they will be noted in your move list in-game. Also for beginners, if you're having difficulty performing special moves on command, I highly recommend slowing down. Street Fighter IV has a very lenient input buffer, which means it will wait a very long time after you finish the move and wait for the button to be pushed. The most common mistake I see from brand new players is they're trying too hard to simultaneously, for say, quarter circle forward, hit forward and hit the button at the same time. This usually results in the game reading the button when you're still at down forward instead of at forward. Slow it down, take it easy, learn everything bit by bit. This will be a common theme through the rest of the presentation. From the slide before, you may have already realized that charge-based inputs have a restriction on them. The charge user must stop and wait to obtain charge before they can perform their moves, where the normal other types of input do not. Pictured here is a somewhat extreme example as to why that is. On the left is the input list for all of Akuma's special moves, and on the right are Guile's. When a character is based on charged specials, a few things tend to be true. Their normal moves are exceptionally good in exchange for having to wait to use their specials, and the specials themselves are also very high quality moves. So although Guile has only two specials, they are extremely good ones. Guile's Sonic Boom is the fastest recovering projectile in the game across all versions of it. And Flash Kick is an extraordinary anti-air against opponents jumping from the front. Also notice that, that Guile can charge both of these moves at once by holding diagonally down back, which will also crouch block. From this position, he is highly intimidating to approach. Most charge characters work this way, having extremely high defense so long as they can keep charge, and having very good normal moves to fall back on if they can't have charge. Speaking of inputs, this is a very common question. Pictured here are the most common options you will see for controlling a fighting game. We have a fight stick in the top left, then a fight pad and a normal game pad to its right. Then in the bottom row, we have a keyboard and a hitbox fight stick. The type of controller you use can offer some slight advantage over others, but nothing is impossible to overcome. I would only recommend against using a keyboard, as it requires you to then jump through some serious hoops to play with it on a console. If that button-based style of input is what you really want, hitbox controllers can offer that in a convenient way. This is an obvious follow-up question to the previous question. To answer it, I have an example. This player's name is Smug the Beast. If you haven't already heard his name, stick with the game and you definitely will. Smug is a 20-year-old American player from New York, and without question in my mind, the best Dudley player in the world. Much of what you're seeing here is extremely tight timing to perform. Layered on top of reading his opponent's attempts to defend against his high aggression. At the end of Super Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition's run, that is, before Ultra Street Fighter 4 was released, of the top 8 Dudley players on Xbox 360, the most competitive online platform, Smug was all of them. Buying a new account on Xbox Live with one time card for one month, plowing the account to top 8, and buying a new card for the new account on the next month. Smug has taken major tournaments against top players, while using what he's comfortable playing on, a completely standard Xbox 360 game. You do not need to play on a fight stick to excel. It's purely a matter of deciding what is comfortable to you and practicing with it. Another clear side note, the current EVO World Champion, Meltdown's Luffy, used a PlayStation 1 controller with an adapter to play on Xbox during his winning run, and still plays on it exclusively.
Again, if you are here out of blind curiosity and are totally new, and are just considering trying the game out, the game's version history may confuse you. Over the six years that Street Fighter IV has existed, Capcom has published four versions which saw full retail release. Vanilla Street Fighter IV at full price, then Super and two others were available as $40 discs. Only Super was necessary to buy as a disc, as Vanilla did not have the capacity to be expanded with DLC. From Super onward, the disc could just be upgraded to the newest version as DLC for $15. If you were so inclined, you could just buy an old Super or Arcade Edition disc used and upgrade it to Ultra for $15. Buying the Ultra disc buys you all the costume DLC that was released prior to the launch of Ultra. The only version you should absolutely not buy is Vanilla. Now let's address what platform to play on. It's not extremely relevant which one you choose as a beginner. Naturally, PC and PS3 are appealing as their online is free. It should be noted, though, that PC's netcode is currently in a shoddy state recently and can lead to some frustrating underwater matches. Xbox has debatably the most competitive community online, and Live is a very stable service, but it is a paid one. Finally, PS3 has lag issues with rendering some stages, and has innate input delay. On the topic of input delay, sources vary, but in essence, a well-equipped PC will emulate an arcade cabinet perfectly. 360 has between 1 and 2 frames of input delay due to VSync issues, and PS3 has 1 or 2 more than 360, which does not count if the stage does not well run well on PS3 already. Finally, it should be noted that if you are attached to Reddit, most of the community there seems to play on PC, and it may be a good place to seek matches as a beginner with other beginners. Up front, I want to clear this up. This is endlessly frustrating to new players. You get to this screen, and you think, oh lovely, I'll just hit quick match since it defaults to that, and I'll play a match. And then you get matched against a 3,000 player point player and get obliterated. Quick match puts you in the first available lobby it can find, and it does not care what your rank is or what your opponent's rank is. Use custom match instead. As you can see, you can force custom match to search for lobbies with players of your skill. If you are completely new, it won't be perfect, but it will be a great deal better than blindly using Quick Match. As a side note for things you shouldn't do, if you are playing Arcade Mode, do remember that Arcade Mode is not representative of playing the game against a real player. On higher difficulties, the game is just reading your inputs, and Ar Arcade Seth and Actual Seth are two extremely different characters. Now let's talk about getting started playing the game. First, we'll need a character. These three characters, Ryu, Balrog, also known as Boxer, and Guile, are generally highly recommended for beginners due to their relatively high defense, clear game plans, and other individual reasons which we will go over shortly. These gifts are to show that just because I'm saying these are good beginner characters, that does not make them boring or shallow. Fancy combos and high damage are generally possible for anyone given enough super meter and depth of understanding with the character. There are other good beginner characters. I also see M. Bison, also known as Dictator, recommended a lot, but I wanted to call this section to focus on three. First, why Ryu? One of the biggest reasons is Ryu being the central template for what's called the Shotokan style of character, referring to his martial art in the game. There are a great many characters pictured in the center who are very similar or slightly similar to Ryu, by either being a variant of the Shotokan style, which definitions vary, but mine is they possess a Hadouken, Fireball, Shoryuken, Uppercut, and Tatsumaki Senpikaku, or Whirlwind Kick. Or they are very close to that style, such as Sagat, who does not possess a Whirlwind Kick, but does have an Uppercut and Fireball. In the two left gifts, notice the combos Ryu and Ken perform are just slight variations of one another. Each jumps in for several hits, then uppercuts their opponent to use their Ultra 1. Similarly, on the right, Oni and Ryu both use their EX Tatsumaki in the corner to get their Ultra 1s thereafter. Learning Ryu sets you up to easily move to other characters like him if you decide you don't like him later. And since Ryu is so well-rounded, an experienced player can watch you play and say, your style is very aggressive, maybe you'd like Ken or Evil Ryu, or something similar. And besides that, Ryu's tools permit you to play effectively with different playstyles without leaving the character. Here is a video of two pretty highly ranked players online. We're going to only watch the first round, but watch what Ryu does to win the round. It's the battle of the century! Fight! Hadouken! Hadouken! What? This is it! Hadouken! 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 Hadou
He never did anything complicated in that round. He just stops Fei Long from getting close to him and punishes his attempts to get close. The second round involves more finesse, but it's still the same idea. Ryu can, game, can win games with very little, just knowing your ranges and where you can hit your opponent from and keeping them from getting comfortable can be enough. In fact, it very often is enough. Now, let's talk about Balrog. Balrog is particularly recommended for players who really hate fireballs. Shown here are several tools Balrog could use to get around fireballs that do not involve jumping. In his turnaround punch in the top left, which is invincible from the waist up, EX dashing straight in the top right, which has armor on it, which we will discuss later, which allows him to absorb the fireball, and his Ultra 1 on the bottom, which is completely invincible as it begins, allowing him to simply pass through the fireball. Using these tools forms the good habit of not always wanting to leave the ground when your opponent throws fire at you. Balrog is a charge character, and fits the criteria which we discussed already. Strong defense, and stellar normal buttons. Notice in the top right that Akuma blocks Balrog's sweep, but can't punish it. Then, after whiffing a normal because Balrog backs up from Akuma's approach, he's swept anyway. Balrog's sweep is among the very best sweeps in the game. Notice that on the bottom right, Balrog's Crouching Fierce is a stellar anti-air. Akuma cannot jump in on him when, when Balrog throws that normal out. On the bottom left as well, notice the amount of space Balrog controls with his normals, preventing Akuma from advancing out of the corner. If Akuma tried to enter that space, he would very likely be hit trying to challenge the swings that Balrog was using. Another greatly appealing aspect to Balrog is the ease with which he can combo into his Ultra 1. Depicted in the top left is his most basic Ultra 1 combo, which works anywhere on the screen, where Balrog combos into his headbutt, then catches his opponent's fall with Ultra 1. Balrog is a strong choice for beginners, as he will naturally learn to control space and the air with his stellar buttons, and can combo properly into your Ultra without high execution, or taking extreme risks by just doing the Ultra Raw. Guile is recommended for many of the same reasons Balrog is being that he's a defensively strong character with fantastic normals that will teach you the space that belongs to you. One of the best fireballs in the game, and a very low combo requirement. To get an idea of just how good Guile's fireball is, see the left gif. Ryu and Guile both fireball at once, which cancels them out. But Guile recovers from throwing his so quickly that he has time to punch Ryu in the face before, Guile, before Ryu can recover from his. A Guile holding down back is very hard to approach, and if you gain the life lead with your great normal attacks, your opponent has to approach you. Notice on the right how Guile can stuff Sakura's air attacks completely with two different buttons. Particularly the second one, Guile's Crouching Fierce, is a remarkably good anti-air, with much less risk than Flash Kick, and no charge requirement. In all, Guile can be a very impregnable fortress, a brick wall, with buttons so strong that aggressive play can work too. Guile may strike you as a dull character for that reason from how badly he wants to down back and keep charge for his specials all day. However, remember that charge character normals are normally exceptional too. Aggressive guile play is not impossible, as shown in this very quick game. Battle is set. Are you ready? Fight! And Part of the strength that Guile, the Guile Mission player, complete. is using here and is Guile's reverse spin kick, fight. also called upside down kick. Yeah. There's the first hit. What's next? The fight is underway. Which of these two challenges? This and that command over there, the bazooka knee. Let's show it again. Right here are two command normals that Guile possesses, which are very, very useful. The bazooka knee, as you can see from the input list on the left, is a command normal which Guile performs by holding back and pushing light kick. This allows him to move forward 
without necessarily having to sacrifice his back charge, allowing him to keep Sonic Boom on the table. Unfortunately, he does not make much use of it here, but it is a very standout normal for Guile to have. I was hoping to stop the video on another use of reverse spin. Here. So let's show it again very quickly. As you can see, Guile is very high up in the air. This means that since he is airborne, he can't be thrown, which is something of a big deal for someone like T-Hawk. Also, because he's so high in the air, low attacks do not hit him. This is a property that is sometimes called low crush, but it means that they are lo low invincible and can't be hit by attacks that only hit low. Now if the characters before don't appeal to you, that's okay. Any character is fine to pick up. The previous ones just lend themselves to beginners particularly well. The only characters I would recommend against playing first are these two, El Forte and C for Crimson Viper. El Forte is a character who is built extremely differently from the other members of the cast. Some say that when you play El Forte, you aren't playing Street Fighter anymore. This is a little harsh, but on top of his eclectic design of running around and confusing his opponent, El Forte has one of the highest execution combos in the game, named Run Stop Fierce, and demonstrated here by the Forte player. It's a pseudo-infinite of extremely high difficulty. Sea Viper is not recommended for a similar reason, hers being referred to generically as Fierce Faint Fierce, a strange, specialized comboing mechanic which basically only she uses. These two aspects are forbidding because you will want to take time to learn them to use to, to utilize the character fully, but this distracts you from learning spacing and solid mechanical play. Plus, if you ever decide you don't like the character after all, you can't apply these skills you've learned to anybody else, unlike the situation with Ryu, where you could apply those general skills to many other characters. Does this mean if you come back to the next to me with a YouTube message or a comment and say, I've taken up Viper, I just love the way she plays. I'm going to say, oh, I refuse to speak to you, you're an idiot. Absolutely not. The other side of the coin to these specialized combos is that if you truly deeply want to learn to play El Forte or Crimson Viper, then you cannot play another character that serves as a gateway to them, like Ryu might help you start out with Ken. To learn to play Viper, you have to start with Viper. That's it. Same for Forte. And ultimately, if a character just speaks to you, you have to pursue that. Let's take a look at an example from myself. Get a load of this guy from Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. I saw Yurian's character design for the first time and thought, excellent character design, Capcom. Clothing was really holding the character back. But when I saw him played, he spoke to me. On the right is an ideal round for Yurian, and not a terribly unlikely one for him to achieve with enough super meter. He's based wholly around knocking his opponent down and forcing him to play a rigged guessing game against him using his Aegis Reflector Super. Despite appearances, he's a charge character. Such an aggressive, juggling-focused charge character who has unblockable setups to boot. Really spoke to me. I simply adore Urian's playstyle. If you feel a character speaks to you that way on a playstyle level, you should pursue that call. There's no feeling like playing a character that you inherently understand. Let's discuss tier lists for a moment, which might have been a concern to some of you. Here's one example of a rough tier list, as determined by a French player, Alion, at the release of Ultra. However, in a game like Street Fighter, traditional tier lists can have a difficult time really capturing the strength of a character. Putting that aside for the moment, let's address a concern that some of you might feel from what I said previously. What if a character who speaks to me is low tier? This video should speak to that. A quick note before we begin, this tier list is rather old and may not be completely in date for the current state of Third Strike. Also, some other games sometimes get made fun of for having really spread out tiers with ranks like Triple S Plus. That's because in Third Strike, it was very necessary to convey just how much better Chun-Li was than everybody else. Also forgive the potato quality. This video is going on 10 years old now.
This video is a little bit harsh to Ricky Ortiz and Justin Wong. At the time, Japan's level of play was extraordinary compared to America's, and Kuroda is sort of a third strike god even among his peers, especially at that time. Here's a chart. Sorry, it's a little rough to read. Detailing matchups, a more reliable way to gauge the strength of a character. Street Fighter is a game where the characters play in a wide variety of ways. No character is going to play the exact same way against every other character. As such, the accepted shorthand for matchups is as follows. Between two players of equal skill, if they played 10 games in a row each using one character, how many games would each player win? In this world, 5-5 five, five denotes an even matchup where neither character has an inherent advantage. The very worst matchups in the game are sometimes described as no worse than 8 to 2. That is, 10 0 matchup is usually meant in jest. One can try to develop a tier list by collecting the average of every matchup in the game and sorting the characters by who has the least bad matchups. But it still doesn't mean that the top tier is invincible, as we showed before. Even horrendously slanted matchups aren't unwinnable if you are simply good enough. Still, some characters have more paths to win a round and perform better against a larger portion of the cast. That is what a tier list for this game is based on, not characters at the top completely dominate everybody beneath. For example, Dulcim is widely regarded as a weak character. However, he gives Evil Ryu trouble when played by a strong player, who knows Dulcim very well. Even on this chart, which is generally sort of lenient for these sort of notations, Evil Ryu versus Dulcim is ranked as 5-5, an even matchup between the character widely regarded as the strongest and a character some would say is one of the five worst. I would like to take a moment here to clarify that this does not mean that tier lists are inaccurate or stupid to use in any way. Simply that you shouldn't look at a tier list and say, oh, my character is in B tier, I should select a better character. Don't let a position on a tier list deter you from playing a character if you really feel that you understand that character. Now that we've gone over some characters to start off with, let's discuss how to improve with your character. By far the most important thing is to practice, and practice cons consistently. Have a goal when you play, like I'm going to win three times today, or I'm going to anti-air my opponent every time I can this match. In the lab here refers to training mode. Practice things you have trouble with or don't understand in the lab until you meet a goal. Say you're practicing a combo. Try to do that combo five times on each side without messing up in a row. Just a little practice each day guarantees improvement, as long as you have a goal in mind. To learn more about your character and ways to use them, there are many replays of high-level play uploaded to channels like iShoryuken and YogaFlame24, and tournaments uploaded to places like Capcom Fighters. You can also seek out information on places like the Shoryuken forums, which have sub-forums for each character, and look for opponents, opponents to spar with on Shoryuken or Reddit, or even better, at a local fighting game community. Ours in Columbus is Columbus Fighting Games, or CFG. Right now, CFG meets in the basement of Donato's on High Street every Tuesday night starting at around 7 p.m. And there's a Facebook group for it as well that you can look up. Links to all of these resources, YouTube channels and otherwise, will be provided in the resources document which is in the description of this video. At the very start, you're going to get beat down a lot just because you don't quite know what your opponents are doing and how to block correctly. Focus on, when knowing, on knowing when your opponent can no longer safely attack and recognize attacks that must be blocked high versus blocked low. Also, don't hold back all the time and back yourself into a corner out of fear that you might not block something. It'll be much easier as you start to learn the ranges your opponent can hit you at to do this, but standing your ground is important. I see many new players back up straight to the edge of the screen and from there, eventually they back themselves into their own corner, and the corner is not a place you ever want to be. Go through each button and get a feel for each one. Note how fast each button is and where the hitbox seems to be. Your character will have a few normal moves that will stand out. Everybody does. Not panicking or feeling nervous when, you're, when playing comes with time, if it's something that happens to you. Practice and being confident in your game plan will eliminate that. No matter how you choose to play, with a gamepad or a fight stick, you will want to strive to make your inputs as smooth and clean as possible, with as little unnecessary movement as possible. This is something trials can be good for. 
Knowing how to punish with your character is also important. We will discuss this more later. Focus on resisting the urge to jump frequently, as we will soon see the problem with jumping. Finally, when focusing on learning combos, practice gradual resistance. You aren't going to suddenly have an epiphany and understand completely how to do a given combo in all situations. You will want to grind out practicing in training mode as we mentioned before, but landing whatever you're practicing in a real match is very different. Ideally, try to find a friendly partner to play against when you're trying out new things, so you will feel more at ease trying them out. Otherwise, you just have to try and fail. You have to mess up in real matches. It's part of learning. I once asked a friend of mine to go into detail on a combo he was doing to me so I could understand potential holes I could exploit. But he shrugged and told me, I just learned this by failing it in matches a thousand times until I didn't fail it anymore. This is a fine and valid way to learn, and difficult combos will at some level be about muscle memory for some people. Finally, we've run out of room on the slide, but combos are important. When you understand all the mechanics we're going to go over, when you understand your character's effective range as well, when you understand the matchups and how your character works in each of them, essentially, when you understand the game, when you get the game and you feel you're playing right, the number one reason you will still lose games is leaving damage on the table. When you get a hit on your opponent, you need to get as much damage from it as you can especially if you were dazzled by the Smug the Beast video earlier. Dudley has to work very, very hard to get that close to his opponent and get that first hit. Because it's so hard, he has to really make all that damage count. He has to make sure that that one touch really pays off. So of course, next you should ask, how do I start learning combos? It can seem logical as a beginner to just find a big list of combos and burn them all into your memory one by one but it is much easier to find a very common combo and understand why each piece of it works. We will discuss deep details of why combos work like frame data and special cancelling later, but take a hard look at each button or special and use a resource like Shoryuken's wiki to understand why the next button or special combos off of it. That way, instead of trying to practice 10 slight variations of one combo, you can learn one cold and the variations will easily follow, because you can more easily understand why the variations work making them easier to remember and incorporate. Focus on the moves you are likely to land in a match, the buttons that are standout strong about your character, and what you can do off of them. For example, Ryu has a stellar crouching medium kick, with excellent range and a good hitbox, and he can use that to then perform a Hadouken and it will combo. He also has a very strong command normal in Forward and Fierce, called Solar Plexus Blow. Solar Plexus Blow can then lead into Crouching Fierce, and from there, he can perform a Shoryuken. Again, with the characters I have recommended, just a few basics will get you far, and then knowing every tool you have at your disposal can get you even farther. A quick caution. If your character has simple short combos, learn them first and get comfortable with using them in matches first. Like on the last slide, you need to make every touch count, but since you are a beginner, worry about getting just some damage first. Don't sweat doing 100% optimal combos right off the bat. You'll overwhelm yourself. Just a simple crouching medium kick and hadouken is far better than trying to do something harder and missing the combo entirely. Always remember, everybody started from nothing. Everybody. When Street Fighter 2 came out, you know what was impressive in the arcade? Knowing how to do special moves. Being able to throw two fireballs in a row without messing up. Never, ever, ever think you are too dumb or too clumsy to learn the execution to play this game. There is very difficult stuff in this game that's hard for anybody to do, but with enough practice, enough dedication, training with goals in mind once every few days, anyone can become the very best. Speaking of trials, you might think they're a great way to learn a character. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. Some trials do show off combos and concepts that the character really does use. However, there are also a lot of trials like this one that are intended as execution challenges and are extremely wasteful of meter and unviable to do in a real match. Trials like this are still useful because they make you do a lot of advanced things in tight sequence, but don't look at them as a guide to a character. Before we start to move on to more conceptual topics, another thing I wanted to make concrete is how hitboxes work in this game. Many of you may already be aware, but despite being a fighter which uses three-dimensional models, Street Fighter 4 still uses hitboxes that are two-dimensional to determine collision. 
such as in this example, this means the hitbox of some moves are not necessarily tight on the model. It has been said by the developers that they began development trying to use tight on the model hitboxes, but that it didn't feel like Street Fighter. This design choice adds some ambiguity, but overall adds one core strength to the game in particular. Whether one move beats another is entirely determined by the speed of the move and its hitbox. There is no priority inherent to a move, though some may still use the word priority to describe a move being very good at beating another one. It also permits some more freedom for some characters to have strong moves that cover a lot of space despite their design. For example, despite being a very small Japanese schoolgirl, if you jump against Sakura and she throws this normal out, your grandparents take 90 damage. Just keep this quirk in mind when a move looks exceptionally strong. In the sources document for this presentation, there will be a link to a website called thecapre.com that can show you every move's hitbox in motion if you were ever curious about what one looks like. Next, let's talk about jumping. It is very tempting to want to jump as a beginner, as it covers a wide distance, gets you over to whatever stuff your opponent is doing on the ground, and jumping attacks deal a great amount of damage and give you a lot of time to follow up if they land. But with few exceptions, once you've entered the air, you've locked yourself into a predictable arc. Once Ryu notices Sagat has left the ground, he can input the Shoryuken calmly and punish the jump because he knows Sagat is 100% going to land on top of it. Sometimes the punishment is merely the uppercut itself. Sometimes it's much worse, as on the right. Jumping too much just to close a gap is a very bad habit, and players can perceive this habit and kill you with it very easily. This is part of why we recommend three characters with very good anti-air attacks. Using them shows you how punishable jumping can be. However, some characters can alter their jump arc. This allows them to mediate the risk of jumping by making their landing point less predictable. The most common mechanic for this is the dive kick. Dive kicks are a very potent tool for a character to possess. Notice on the left that Yun jumps in place and beats Bison's attempt to anti-air him by dive kicking forward. The act of dive kick doesn't just change his trajectory, it also delays his fall ever so slightly, guaranteeing that he gets around the normal that Bison put out. On the right, Rufus is able to jump in place and not commit fully to a forwards jump and only dive kicks forwards to close the gap when he sees Poison has committed to a fireball. These are what makes dive kicks like theirs so strong. The ability to jump and decide freely while in the air whether or not to go in, giving their opponent less much, much less time to react. However, also notice that when Yun completes his dive kick, he has to tech a throw attempt from Bison. Yun is not the one initiating that throw. This is because even though he hit Bison, the hit, hit was so high up that Yun is still unsafe. In short, dive kicks make jumping less dangerous, but leaping all over the place will still eventually get you hit. We're going to talk about a lot of general concepts now. These slides are taken from a series made during Vanilla Street Fighter 4 called the 2D Fighter Tutorial. Again, there is a source document for all of these GIFs and videos, and I highly recommend giving the 2D type Fighter Tutorial a watch if you don't watch anything else. An important concept to get down right away is that being knocked down isn't just something that happens when your opponent is done hitting you. You are still in danger as you stand up. You are still being penalized for getting hit in the first place. As your opponent gets to play a guessing game against you, that favors them. The safest and most consistent thing to do is to block your opponent's attempts to hit you again and wait it out. One of your opponent's options is a media attack. We'll discuss phases of a move later to make this more clear. But a media attack is, as noted, when your opponent is waking up, you have the freedom to put out a hitbox that is waiting there as they stand, which they must block. Any attack can be a meaty, but some attacks are better at it than others, which is why we call some moves meaties, even though any move can be. What if I'm getting pressured into the ground and I'm sick of my opponent sticking out meaty attacks? Your character may have an attack that can be used as a reversal such as Ryu's Shoryuken, which is invincible while it starts up. So you will go through the media attack with your invincibility frames and hit your opponent. However, your opponent could also just block, and good reversals are disastrous when blocked in exchange for their invincibility. As noted, take great care when using a reversal, as it is usually worse to have your reversal blocked than it would have been to just be hit and comboed by a media in the first place. Remember, you are the one at a disadvantage when knocked down. 
Reversals are, as noted here, high risk, low reward. Being cornered is a similar penalty. With your back to the wall, you can no longer move towards that direction, restricting your options in a way similar to being knocked down. Never contentedly walk yourself into a corner for free. Your opponent will gladly hang you there and abuse the advantage you gave them. Your opponent could also choose to throw you instead of using a meaty attack. A throw is performed by pressing the light kick and punch buttons at once. Every fighter has a throw. Throws beat blocking, like scissors beat paper. You will see many throws done as shown here, as a tick throw. Tick throw refers to throwing your opponent just as they leave block stun, as in they've just blocked some attacks, but you are free to move wherever they are free to move. Your opponent can't do anything while they're in block stun, but they also cannot be thrown, meaning it is possible to go for a tick throw too quickly. If you tick throw correctly, though, you will throw your opponent before they have time to do anything at all. If you are about to be thrown, you can tech the throw by also inputting the throw command, which will cause you and your opponent to break away from one another, canceling the throw attempt. All throws start up in the exact same time across all characters. For your reference, that time is two frames. Since Street Fighter 4 is a 60 frames per second game, this means 1 30th of a second. They are also active for two frames total after those startup frames. Again, another 1 30th of a second. This means that even if your opponent is in block stun for the first active frame of your throw and you mess up, you are, if they are no longer in block stun on the second active frame, the, th the throw will still connect. If you whiff the throw completely by going too early or being too far away, you will perform a whiffed throw animation with la which lasts for 20 frames, or a third of a second, a relatively long time. Beware, some special moves are unthrowable, and completely invincible moves like the Shoryuken in most reversals, also cannot be thrown. Yet another option is to go for a cross-up, an attack with a hitbox that hits your opponent on their back if you jump over them. Some characters don't have a jumping cross-up like the one demonstrated here, but if they do, it's a strong offensive option on an opponent waking up or standing close to you and acting defensively towards ground play. Even better, with some jump spacings, a cross-up can make reversals whiff by going the wrong direction. Some characters can set up this reversal whiffing using what's known as a safe jump, but this concept is quite advanced and character specific, so keep it in mind as something to look up later. A cross-up must be blocked still holding away from your opponent, so Gen here must hold to the right to block this cross-up. As you can see, there are many possible ang angles of attack for the person knocking their opponent down and the defender must in turn react with the correct defense. This moment is of such importance that it has a name. You may hear it called okizeme, the Japanese term for wake-up game, or sometimes just oki for short. Okizeme is a tremendous force in Street Fighter IV, so even for defensively minded characters, never let your opponent breathe easy if you knock them down. Walk up to them, make them scared, keep them under pressure with your options, or pretend to go for something and bait a reversal out and punish that. While we're discussing content from the 2D Fighter tutorial, I'd like to point out another good thing it outlines, which is fireballs as a concept. Characters with access to projectiles often frustrate new players as they have trouble dealing with them. As the image notes, fireballs restrict your options and force you to take actions that are more predictable because your valid actions are less varied. How does one deal effectively with being zoned by fireballs? The answer depends a little on your character. As we noted in Balrog's section, Balrog has many tools which go through fireballs. Because he has those tools, an opposing Ryu will generally not want to throw fireballs unless Balrog is very far away. Guile's Sonic Boom is so fast and so good that he would happily simply throw one into, his fi into Ryu's fireballs over and over to gain super meter from the trading blows. But you have three generic options on all characters when a fireball comes out. The first is obviously to jump. Unfortunately, your opponent is usually hoping you will. As shown here, even though Balrog doesn't jump in on Ryu, he's still anti-aired by the uppercut because he was too close. However, most of the time a neutral jump is a reasonable way to avoid a fireball. The second is to use your focus attack, a mechanic we will look at in depth in a few slides. You can absorb the fireball hit as long as it's only one hit and dash forward or backward depending on how you want to space things out. The third is often almost not even considered by new players, but just trying to walk forward and block quickly is a valid way to deal with fireballs. You can see that Balrog gets pushed back when he, when he blocks a fireball. 
You can usually make up some of that distance by walking forward immediately and quickly reacting with another block when you see your opponent throw another fireball. This is a good option because you never forfeit your ability to block like focus dashing and especially jumping do. Your end goal is to make your opponent feel uncomfortable with how close you are so that he stops throwing fireballs. If he doesn't stop and you're close enough to jump in, then do it. Jumping is not inherently bad. Jumping predictably is. If your opponent throws a bad fireball and you see it, the recovery on all but the fastest fireballs like Sonic Boom is so long that you can react to the startup, jump over the fireball, and get heavy damage from a jump-in combo. Health totals are one of the many non-displayed facets of each character that varies depend on who you're playing. Zongief and Seth have both been hit by the same attack, but Seth appears to have taken more damage. This is because Seth's health total is much lower than Zongief's, even though they both start out with the same size bar. Your character's true health number is something to consider when taking risks. Other non-displayed differences between characters is forwards and backwards walking speed, forwards and backwards dashing speed, stun total, throw damage, and more. This is also a good place to mention damage scaling due to damage taken. You take 100% of all damage inflicted when you start out the round. However, once you fall beneath 50% of your health total, all damage inflicted from that point onward is reduced to 95% of its normal damage. Once you fall beneath 30%, that damage is further reduced to 90%, and once you fall beneath 15%, it drops the, all the way to 75%. Keep in mind when an opponent gets low, they have this sort of damage reduction factor. This does not have a particular name in Street Fighter 4, but I have seen it called in other games, Guts. This amusing little video demonstrates a few things I wanted to point out about Super Meter. Whiffing special moves still gives you a little special meter, and being hit also gives you a small amount. Of course, ordinarily you'll get much more meter from actually hitting attacks, but it's useful to be able to throw out special moves from safe distances to round out bars of meter. Who will emerge a champion? Small note that didn't fit anywhere else. Special moves generally also have an EX version, usually costing one bar of your super meter, which gives the move additional properties. It doesn't necessarily make it a strictly better version of the move, so look into what your character's EX specials do. In this video, you can see Ken throw out his EX Shoryuken, which he uses because of the EX version is invincible for longer and hits more times. So if his opponent blocked, he was more likely to ship him out. We'll talk about Chip in a little bit. Pick up the pace! Fight! In Ultra Street Fighter 4, every character has three choices of Ultra Combo before the match begins. For most characters, their choice of whether to take Ultra 1 or 2 depends on their opponent, 
with W or double being if they believe both would be useful, though W penalizes the damage done by each ultra in exchange for having both available. The penalty varies by character. For example, Zangief's Ultra 1 is a devastating command grab with instant startup, or his Ultra 2 is an anti-air attack. Choosing W greatly penalizes the damage each of them does, because having both tools is extraordinarily useful to Zangief in many scenarios. On the other side of the spectrum, Balrog's Ultra 1 is considered by many players to be vastly superior in all situations to his Ultra 2 for many reasons, making it not a choice at all. Most Balrog players will choose Ultra 1 in every matchup. Ultra selection varies heavily from character to character and matchup to matchup, so understand why each of them do what each of them do for your character and when to consider taking one, the other, or both. Focus attacks like throws are something everyone has, done by pushing the strong and forward, or medium punch and medium kick, buttons at once. Releasing them instantly grants you a level 1 focus, holding them until your character flashes white gives you level 2 and holding them until the attack releases on its own gives you level 3. As you can see in the bottom two GIFs, fulfilling the condition on the right gives you a crumple, leaving your opponent defenseless. During your focus attack, you can absorb one hit of damage with, with what is commonly called armor. Some attacks, however, hit more than once, or they have a property which allows them to break armor regardless of the number of hits. Most special moves as well, when done as reversals, gain armor-breaking properties. For example, the Dragon Punch does not innately break armor, but will gain that property when done as a reversal. So take care when using focus attacks too predictably. Armor also does not protect you from being thrown. You can cancel focus attacks with a dash at any time, including after they've hit. So if you get a crumple, you can chase close to your opponent, or if you just want that one hit of armor to escape pressure, you can dash away. However, sort of like throws dealing varying damage from character to character, the shape of the character's focus attack, and sometimes other properties, are unique to that character. Try your focus attack out and get a feel for how far it reaches and how good the hitbox is. Also, like how the revenge gauge, or ultra meter, fills when you're hit, it fills just as much from taking hits using armor. You can absorb predictable attacks with armor and gain ultra for free. Red focus attacks share most properties with normal ones, but cost two bars of special meter to use, and are performed by pushing the focus attack buttons, medium kick and medium punch, plus any other button at the same time. In exchange for the increased cost, red focus can absorb an infinite number of hits, user health allowing, and deals 1.5 times the damage of a normal focus. It is still, like the normal version, susceptible to armor breaking moves, reversals, and throws. Here is also the best place to discuss white health. It represents the damage taken from absorbing attacks with armor. If you are hit with white health on your health bar, as in the right GIF, you will lose all of the white health, and the damage you took is calculated starting from the end of the white health, or the real health that you have. Once you stop taking damage with white health on your life bar, you will slowly regenerate it back into real health over time. Should you absorb more damage than you have life, you will begin to lose white health equal to the damage taken, which will no longer be recovered once the damage stops. Command grabs are essentially throws, which have an input beyond the normal throw input. In Zangief's case, this is the 360 motion and a punch button. There are multiple kinds of command grabs. Zangief's inflicts large damage. Others do no damage at all, but allow the person doing it to follow up with normal attacks. In exchange for their higher, higher power and usually different range from normal throws, since they cannot be teched. The recovery frames on whiffed command grabs are very high. Characters like Zongaf who are very focused on command grabs, and usually possess 360 inputs, are normally referred to as grapplers. Like normal throws, you cannot be command grabbed while in block stun, and the majority of command grabs are defeated by being airborne. Beware of command grab ultras. Many are very quick to start up, and some start up instantly once they have been input, leaving you no time to move away from them or jump. If you take too much punishment in a short span of time, you will fall out of the combo you are in and stand up, stunned, unable to block or perform any action. You can attempt to mash all of your buttons and spin the joystick to escape stun, which makes it wear off more quickly, but generally your opponent will have enough time to do anything that they would like. However, the damage scaling from the combo they were doing before the stun occurred carries over into the combo they do next. Notice how little damage Seth does on the right compared to the left. 
This is because he stunned Yang from one hit, but stunned Chun-Li from many, causing his damage to be greatly reduced from how long his combo was. The damage scaling is always at work in any combo. The more hits involved, the higher the damage reduction for every subsequent move becomes. You can witness the amount of damage scaling and note the amount of percentage damage scaling you are taking by going into training mode. Now that we've mentioned damage scaling, just to define the term, I'd like to mention resets briefly. You may hear the term from time to time. A reset is when you attempt to stop and restart your combo to reset the damage scaling on it. Usually this is done by deceiving your opponent, as on the left. Yang is actually never on the right of Oni after he lands. He uses a normal move which moves his model forward to make it appear that he's on the right when he's actually still on the left, tricking Oni into blocking him properly. You can also trick your opponent into blocking wrong by stopping a combo in a way they won't expect. Cody on the right is expecting Dudley to continue his combo, and is holding down back hoping Dudley will drop it and allow him to block. Dudley imagines this is the case, and instead stops his combo in a strange spot and does an overhead in an illogical place, which hits Cody because he's blocking low and resets him since he's trying to block low. Don't worry yourself too much with learning resets early on, as they are still somewhat dangerous. If your opponent believes that you will reset them, they can just spam out an invincible move like a dragon punch. If you attempt to reset, their, res their invincible move will beat your reset. Even in the Yang example, he would get hit if Oni had been spamming dragon punch instantly as he landed. A block string, as noted here, is a string of hits while your opponent is blocking. A true block string does not give your opponent any time to do anything while you are attacking them. As the text notes, Ideally, when you are aware you are being blocked, you would like to alternate high and low attacks to make your opponent accidentally block incorrectly, while still leaving yourself safe to any reversals your opponent has. For example, a very bad block string for Balrog would be to end his block string with a headbutt, as he would be open for punishment if, he were, if Ryu were blocking. How do you know when to block string? This is why almost every combo ideally begins with a few quick, light hits even though you may have noticed this will overall cause more damage scaling. Those few starting hits allow you to hit confirm, which means you get time to register in your head if you're actually hitting your opponent or they're blocking. After those initial hits, you can decide whether to go for a block string or a full damage combo. In the Balrog example, if he were hitting his opponent, he would headbutt after hit confirming, and the gif shows a possible block string alternative if they're blocking instead. Try to set the dummy in training mode to random block to practice hit confirming and reacting to being blocked. Also of note, if you are in a true block string and there are no gaps at all when you can act, your character will continue to block even if you aren't holding back the entire time. This is a dangerous tidbit to know, and it's why it's a common scrub Ken tactic to start st slamming out Shoryuken inputs while you're blocking, as if the block string is not true and it gives you any time to act, you will instantly come out with an invincible move that will beat out your opponent's attempt to continue the combo. However, if your opponent knows that you will do this, there are many ways to do block strings that end suddenly and leave the, the person doing them safe, which can bait out Shoryukens and leave the scrub Ken open to eating way, way more damage than if they'd even not blocked to begin with. This fact is presented for your information only. Be extremely cautious about trying to use it. These are examples of common, not true block strings being blown up. Normally, these combos would combo on hit, but they leave block string gaps on block. Unlike the fact mentioned in the last slide, these holes are not execution errors. Even executed perfectly, the Rose and Yun combos, if blocked, are not true block strings, even though they will always combo on hit. It is an extreme case, but if your opponent senses that you are going to hit them with a block string that gives them time to act, they can respond with invincible attacks such as on the left, or in the right's case, they can absorb the hit with armor and follow up after that. When being blocked, be careful not to give your opponent the chance to slam out a dragon punch on you, something that you will likely run into online. Footsies is a very important concept in Street Fighter. It refers to the process of gaining a position on your opponent without losing position yourself. It is so named since many of the best footsie tools are low kick buttons. You can't always just jump in on or walk up to your opponent and do that combo you've been practicing in training mode. You have to gain that position with footsies. Pictured here is one of many scenarios where both players slowly walk back and forth, 
jockeying for position, blocking each other's attacks. Dudley lands one solid hit, then two. Then Balrog whiffs a normal, which Dudley tags with a button he can combo from, after which Balrog is knocked down and in the corner, the worst position one can find themselves in. Footsies and the neutral game is a very high focus in Street Fighter IV, and a large part of why the game is described as slow. It is very difficult to quickly close gaps against a defensive player for most characters. Learning to play footsies well takes a lot of learning about the ranges every character likes to stand at, particularly, of course, your own, and can only be learned with time and experience with your character. Again, understand all your buttons and their ranges so that you can use appropriate buttons at appropriate distances. Remember that every round starts with both players at a neutral footsie range, and remember that you can always choose to do nothing and wait. If you have the lead in life, it is your opponent who must, make, who must take that lead from you. This mentality is really where Guile and Balrog in particular thrive. Footsies of the Concepts is quite complex, is the best word. One could go on for a very long time talking about footsies and different applications, the amount of mind games that go on in a footsies state. For a very good guide on footsies, in the resources document there will be linked an article from Sonic Hurricane, which is called the Footsies Handbook, which is generally regarded as one of the best things to read for a description of a very complete picture of footsies. Going at length, just sort of regurgitating the, foots, the footsies handbook here would make this probably another hour longer of a presentation, and I'm sure nobody wants that. Punishing attacks is a very good skill to learn with your character. This video was made after an El Forte player stole a tournament, beating everybody there because his EX Quesadilla bomb had been buffed in a new version of the game, and nobody knew how to punish it properly. Attacks like this, Blanca's rolling ball attacks, and reversals are things you should find a high damage response for that you're comfortable using, as whiffing a reversal isn't bad if you don't punish the whiff. The source for this video, if you wish to know ways to punish El Forte in this quesadilla bomb, will be posted in these sources document once again. It goes through every character alphabetically and lists every, every character's punish. However, when it gets to Zongief, Zongief actually has lost his easiest punish in the most recent version. I've mentioned whiff punishing before in passing, but being able to whiff punish in the truest sense of the term is difficult, and it, but is an extremely strong skill. It has been called by some as true footsies, not just jockeying for position on your own, but being able to punish your opponent's attempt as well. Pictured here is an extreme whiff punish that's almost difficult to see in a gif. Balrog is jabbing Sagat out of a very far-reaching normal before Sagat's normal can start up. The very frame Sagat extends his leg. Sagat wants to put the limb out there to check Balrog walking forward, but Balrog knows he'll do that and puts out a much faster normal to check Sagat's check. This is a skill you may come to use almost subconsciously as you become familiar with pl players you play a lot, or characters you see a lot. Being able to do it on command with clarity against anybody is a skill that comes with extreme amounts of experience. Be aware of it, but don't break yourself trying to learn it too quickly. You might have noticed that you take very slight amounts of damage when you block some attacks. This is called chip damage, and in Street Fighter 4 this occurs when you block any special attack, super or ultra. Pictured here is an extreme case. DJ has access to a combo which deals 200 damage on ch in chip when blocked, though he has to burn a full super and ultra to do it. As here, you can die from chip damage, so watch out for your opponent to do reckless things to chip you out if you become extremely low on health. <clears throat> so that we can discuss some coming topics more rigidly, let's make concrete what I mean when I say startup and recovery. These GIFs are of a particularly lengthy normal Chun Li has, to, to illustrate the three phases every move in the game has. Startup is the amount of time a move takes to become active, that is, every frame before the move's hitbox exists. Active is how long that hitbox stays on screen, 
and recovery is the amount of time that you spend after the hitbox leaves the screen waiting before you can do any action, whether that be using another move or blocking. In Street Fighter 4, these phases are measured in recovery in number of frames, or sixtieths of a second. You will often hear moves discussed particularly in terms of their startup, advantage on hit, the amount of time your opponent is stunned when you hit after you have completed recovery, and advantage on block, like advantage on hit, but for when your opponent blocks, and this number is oftentimes negative, indicating that you are still recovering when your opponent may take action. Special cancelling is when a move's recovery frames are cancelled by a special. When special cancelling a move, you do not wait for the button you pushed to recover. You input the special move just as or just after your attack connects. Notice how in this gif, Cody strikes Ibuki with his fist with his crouching fierce, then instantly wheels around to perform the uppercut. Normally, the crouching fierce Cody used would recover for quite a while, but the special cancel eliminates the time and instead begins another damaging attack. Notice how when you hit an opponent successfully, time seems to stop for a very brief moment on screen. This is called hit stop, and if you are aiming to complete the input for a special cancel during this frozen time. Special canceling is integral for everyone to understand the timing of, as it is the core of every combo involving special moves. Note, however, that special canceling can't be done with every normal. Being special cancelable is a property a move can possess, like being armor breaking. If you question whether a move is special cancelable or not, again, check a resource like the Shoryuken Wiki. You may have heard the term Link thrown around a lot before. Street Fighter 4 is known for having many difficult links. A link is when you perform a normal attack immediately following another normal attack, after that first normal has totally finished recovering. Doing links properly is the basis of normal combos. Some links are easy, others are very tight with as little as one frame links, being the tightest ones. One frame links means you have exactly one sixtieth of a second to input the next attack. Too early and nothing happens. Too late and your attack is blocked. You can tell, you can tell for yourself what the link window is between attacks by looking at the advantage on hit of one, of one attack and the startup of another. Let's say some example attack is plus seven on hit. This means the longest startup attack that can be linked after it will have seven frames of startup. In this case, it will be a one frame link. Anything less long on startup widens this window. So a three frame startup attack would be a four frame link. Learning link timing is again a matter of practice. You'll eventually learn to feel the timing from muscle memory. Chains, in contrast, are when you're able to cancel the recovery of a normal attack with another normal attack meaning mashing the button will work, where for links it will not. Chain combos aren't something everybody gets. However, some chains come with a draw, all chains rather, come with a drawback. If you chain cancel into a normal attack, that normal cannot be special canceled from. So if you do three jabs and chain the last two, neither of those jabs can have any special attacks canceled into from them. Your character will just not perform the attack if you try. However, if you chain the second jab, then properly link the third, the third jab can be special cancelled off of just fine. It's rare to have to worry about this, but it can come up with characters like Balrog. If you're practicing the bread and butter Ultra 1 combo and the headbutt just won't come out, slow down the jabs and slow down the short that come before it, as you are probably chaining them together. Finally, some characters have what can be called target combos, which are combos that have the same input timing as chains, i.e. very lenient timing. Your character may have one target combo, many, or none. Check your move list in-game to see if you have any. Not all target combos are necessarily useful, but it can't hurt to understand all your tools and they are very easy to use. A frame trap is using the parts of a move and frame data we've been discussing in an aggressive manner, even when you aren't quite on the winning end of the mathematics. As noted here, a frame trap tricks your opponent into thinking they can attack when they actually can't. In this GIF, Cody performs three frame traps. In the first, he intentionally gives his opponent one frame of advantage between the attacks connecting. It is the same for the next two, which leave three frame window and four frame window, respectively. This means that he can get his opponent to think that they have a moment where they can press a button, as it's not a block string. But they have so little time that if the button is not invincible or faster than the window he leaves open, they will be counter hit out of the attack. 
Frame traps are thus very a very offensive tactic to have in your game plan. Some characters are particularly suited for it, like Cody and Dudley. Part of the goal of some frame traps is to try and score a counter hit, which is when you hit your opponent during the startup of an attempted attack. Counter hits cause your attack to deal slightly more damage and have slightly more hit stun, meaning it will be slightly more positive on hit, going back to the frame data we mentioned. Some characters can perform combos only on counter hit, but this is, again, a very advanced character-specific thing to consider. Consider studying it if you see it come up when studying your character of choice. Watch the following GIF. How did Seth react so fast? Did he just do it randomly? Is a Seth player a god? Well, the last one is actually technically correct. Punko is a god. But he didn't react to the attack per se. Observe Seth's inputs on the left. Notice how the arrows appear before Adon moves. This is called buffering. Seth decides, I'm going to watch Adon closely and do the motion for my ultra. If I see Adon leave the ground at all, I'll push my, all my punches and ultra will come out. If I don't see him move, I'll just keep playing footsies as normal. It's a little bit more difficult to see in the gif than in the proper video, but you could see Seth ducking briefly as he buffers, because his ultra has two quarter circles, which start it down. You could watch to see if your opponent is buffering if they duck repeatedly for no reason. And you could also try to spook them into using their ultra recklessly. Be wary that you don't let this happen to you as well. This is another use of buffering, which falls under the large umbrella of what's called an option select. When I started out in Street Fighter 4, I immediately thought option select sounded like some really scary advanced thing that I'd have to try really hard to wrap my head around. Amusingly, option selects are the exact opposite. An option select is when you make the game do the thinking for you. Here is one strong example which many characters can use. On the left, Dudley throws out his standing roundhouse, his little uppercut punch, and he hopes Dalsim will stick a limb into it. Watch his inputs on the left as he throws out the standing roundhouse. He does the input for a special move, but it doesn't come out. Why? Because he's still recovering from the standing roundhouse. So naturally, another special move can't just come out, while he's still busy recovering from that attack. On the right, though, the standing roundhouse whiff punishes a normal that Dalsim put out there like he had planned on the left. Now the same input Dudley did on the left comes out because he hits something with the standing roundhouse, and the input works as a special cancel. This is at the core of all option selects. You use properties of the game's engine to let the game think for you. Here are two more examples of option selects. The flashy one on the left is hard to see, but Ken whiffs a crouching short kick, and while the crouching short is out, he very quickly inputs his ultra too. Ordinarily, if the short connected, whether hit or blocked, nothing would happen, because the ultra input would come out during the hit stun or hit or block stun, and his short can't be cancelled into ultra. But if the short whiffs, which it did because Akuma teleported, then the ultra comes out. On the left, Ryu knocks Seth down and meaties him with jumping roundhouse. However, Seth backdashes, making the roundhouse whiff, as backdashes give you a small window of invincibility. There, there wasn't a neater place to mention that fact, but it's very important. Backdashes give you a small period of invulnerability. Remember that. You're also airborne. But while in the air, Ryu did the input for Tatsu, and when the roundhouse whiffs, the Tatsu comes out immediately upon landing. I'll take a moment to note here something difficult to show on a slide, but one option select everybody has is called crouch teching. Try crouching and pushing the input for a throw sometime. You don't get a throw. Instead, you get a crouching short. However, if someone were throwing you the moment you did this, you'd tech the throw because you pushed the throw input yourself, even though you were crouching. This means that when in the defense and fearing a throw attempt, you can do this crouch tech, and if they throw you, you break away. And if they don't throw you, you get a crouching short, which hopefully they must block or beat. Don't overuse this option select too much, as it can be baited out and punished, with some characters being able to punish crouch teching extremely hard. Now let's give a moment to raw hard reads. Making a raw hard read is when, without any option selects to protect you, you make a dangerous decision based on what you believe your opponent will do next. In this gif, Zangief here lands a combo, and EX Vanishing Flat leaves him and Ken recovering at roughly the same time. A common tactic for Zangief is to throw or command grab from this position. Zangief believes Ken is afraid of that and will jump away to protect himself from being thrown, 
So trusting his judgment, he immediately throws out his anti-air ultra too to catch Ken's jump away. Evo moment number 37 is a very famous example of a read. In Third Strike, part of what makes Chun-Li one of the very best characters is her amazing Super Art 3, which starts up very close to instantly. In this video, the Ken player, Daigo Umahara, plays very aggressively into the Chun-Li, Justin Wong, pressing him because Justin did not have access to his super. However, but the However, an exchange of hits put Daigo extremely close to death and gives Justin just enough time to use his super. But the mechanic that makes Third Strike distinct from other Street Fighter games is the parry system. By inputting forward seven frames before an attack you are, you are struck by an attack, you can parry it, leaving you slightly less disadvantaged than blocking would have left you, negating pushback, and preventing you taking any damage, even chip. With Justin and Daigo separated by a large space, Daigo knows it is extremely tempting to Justin to try and randomly super to chip him out. Daigo begins pushing forwards intermittently to catch the super combo and parry it. After executing a flawless parry, Daigo takes no chip damage and defeats Justin with a punish for his predictable play. Many people can perform this parry, and have done so in arcades in Japan and other places, but this is a remarkable because Justin did it in an enormous tournament in a room filled with people who are rooting for Justin, far away from his home and his crowd. Because of this, parrying Chun-Li's super has come to be called the Daigo Parry. Let's see it in action. Observe Chun Li's super meter. One. One day, as you play, you're going to get really mad. You're going to play a guy who does silly things and you'll lose, and you'll be mad that you lost to things you should have known better than to be hit by. Or you'll feel you played right and won't understand how you could have played better. In games as involved, passionate, and personal as fighting games are, it's very easy to get inside your own head and get extremely worked up and angry because you're usually not mad at your opponent, you're mad at yourself. Take solace, though, that you'll never be quite as mad as Sanford Kelly. If you ever get abusive messages on the platform of your choice, just remember how mad you were when you got salty and try to forgive them. And if you ever do get really angry, you should consider taking a break, as very few people play better when angry and usually just make themselves more mad. Now let's mention some of the deeper mechanics that make Street Fighter 4 what it is. Most important is Focus Attack Dash Cancel, or FADC. Most special attacks can be cancelled early by inputting a focus attack. Your character will flash yellow when you do this successfully. You can then dash forward immediately out of the focus attack. This is what is at work when you see Ryu uppercut, then dash forward in Ultra 1. FADCs can also make unsafe actions more safe, such as using a reversal and then cancelling with an FADC instead of flying into the air if you're blocked. FADCs are usually at the heart of the strongest combos in this game, but though it's not shown here, each FADC costs two bars of Super Beater to perform, so you can only have so many available to you at any time. Further, for most attacks like the standard Shoryuken, if you don't hit your opponent at all, you can't FADC, and some attacks can't be FADC'd no matter what happens. Red Focus Cancel, sometimes also called EX Red Focus, is a new mechanic introduced in Ultra Street Fighter 4. It is called by a different name because it costs 3 meters instead of the usual cost of 2 for a red focus, or FADC. But in exchange, if you let the focus attack go instantly when it's used as a cancel, your opponent will be crumpled instantly, unlike with any other use of red focus or normal focus cancels. This opens up some characters for extremely high damage combos, Yun being the poster child for this. Your character might have a good use for red focus cancels, but it's a very expensive advance investment to make. Be wary of saving meter for it too much when you could be using EX moves or FADCs which might be more effective, or even just saving up one more bar to have a full super. 
Like option selects, plinking is an abuse of the engine. As you're probably aware, the engine forbids mashing if you want to do links. However, with plinking, or p-linking, or piano linking, as they may be called, you force the engine to see two inputs of a button when you only pushed it once. The red boxes show what a successful plink will look like in your input stream. To perform a plink, you push a button, then a lighter button the frame afterward. The game gives heavier buttons priority. If you've ever pushed the all punches or all kicks buttons on their own, you've noticed that you always get the heaviest kick or the heaviest punch. So when you do a plink, the game tries to give the heavier button more priority, but in doing so reads the heavier button twice. Plinking is used for difficult links, as because the game sees the input twice but doesn't think you're mashing, it gives you an additional frame of leeway when done correctly. Plinking easily is the primary advantage to playing on a fight stick, as the buttons lend themselves to it easily. At the conclusion of the slide set, I will try to demonstrate the sound that plinking makes. It's a very distinct noise, and you will probably be able to look up videos which will show you using a hand camera what plinking looks like. Regrettably, I do not have that capacity myself. I mentioned safe jumps before, and that they were quite advanced, character-specific techniques, but I wanted to discuss them more rigidly even so, to make sure it's clear what they are and how they work. This is a kind of dense topic now in Ultra, so stay with me. You may have already known, it's odd I haven't fit this in earlier, that most times when you're knocked down, you can push two buttons or tap down as you hit the ground to tech the knockdown and cause you to stand quickly. These knockdowns where you are allowed to do this are called soft knockdowns. However, there are a few cases where you cannot tech the knockdown, known as hard knockdowns. Hard knockdowns occur if you are swept, thrown, by most throws, odd exceptions exist, like Lakota's forward throw, which doesn't knock down at all, or hit by any hit of a super or ultra combo. This gif is from a very nicely made video detailing many safe jumps Dudley can make use of. In this case, the 4F in the bottom left means that his safe jump, this safe jump in particular, will work against reversals that start up in four frames if Dudley back throws his opponent, in this case particularly EX Ryukens. It may not, however, work against other four frame reversals that are not EX Ryukens. Observe how Dudley back throws his opponent, whiffs crouching short, and then jumps and uses roundhouse. If his opponent does nothing or blocks or blocks wrong, they just block it. But if they try and reversal, the reversal misses because it starts up too slow to catch Dudley before he's able to sit on the ground and block. Again, safe jumps are very character specific and something you only want to consider learning if you're pursuing total mastery over your character or if you have a friend who pumps reversals a lot and you want to slap him up for it on their one character. But knowing safe jumps gives you the ability to rig the guessing game your opponent must play against you even harder, assuming they don't recognize that it's a safe jump. Their options in Okizeme become even further limited, making their only option to block, even though you've chosen a media attack, as their reversal will lose. However, in Ultra, one more option was added for the defender to combat characters who were extremely pred predicated on safe jumps, at that time namely Kami. Now if you are hard knocked down and press two buttons as you hit the ground, like you might to tech normally, you will stand up slightly later than you otherwise would, precisely 11 frames later. This will then leave you on the ground while the safe jump is executed, freeing you from having to guess how to block the safe jump. It should be noted, however, that when you do this, like when you tech soft knockdowns, the words technical appear after you do the delayed wake-up input successfully. Some characters can perform safe jumps in a way that lets them react to this technical's appearance on the screen and adjust to their option such that they will still safe jump you and force you to block a media anyway. Again, again, this is something for far down the line that you should know exists and be able to come back to this slide later and think about. Do not focus on this sort of tech when you're just getting started, as you're distracting yourself from more fundamental things to learn. A kara throw, kara being Japanese for empty, is a technique where you push an attack button, then immediately throw. Some characters like Ken and Viga, also known as Claw, will move forward a significant distance with some attacks, but you will be able to throw before the attack begins meaning they can stand far away from you, then suddenly be an extra several feet closer to you and throw you. Most attacks, most characters can technically perform a Kara throw, but usually they don't get very much distance out of it, not nearly as much as Ken and Viga in particular do. 
if these are your characters, this is something you should know about. Otherwise, just know that it's something these characters could do to you. This was a little too overwhelming to try and stuff in when we were first discussing jumping, but there's an important concept that's very difficult to see without being told. Trip guard refers to an invisible sequence of events that happen every time you land from a jump. When you land from any normal jump, excluding special super jumps like Ibuki and Sea Viper have, you are put in a landing state for four frames. If you don't push any normal button while you're in the air, you won't notice these landing frames because you can cancel them into anything, a normal, a special, throwing, but most importantly, blocking. This is notable because if you do push a button in the air, the first two frames of landing can't be canceled into anything. You are allowed to tech throw attempts against you during that, for, during that time, but you can't block or do anything else. This is what tends to happen a lot with Rolento's Ultra 2, shown here. The Ultra trip guards Ryu because he pushed a button in the air and can't block when he lands. If Ryu hadn't done anything in the air, he could hold down, block, down back and block the Ultra instead. This concept, along with hit stop and block stun, make jumping and pushing no button in the air at all an offense option that usually makes little sense to newcomers, but can be extremely potent against an opponent, opponent who worriedly blocks at all times. Because you, chose, you have those extra two frames and you aren't causing hit stop by attempting an attack, your opponent waits to block high as you jump in or attempt a cross up, and too quickly for them to react, you can instead land and throw or land and do a low attack. This is called an empty jump. And unfortunately, though it's a valuable extra option for offense, truly understanding it calls for the understand calls for the explanation in this slide. To close it out, I have another funny little video honoring our boy Gandhi. The announcers pretty well cover the point of this video, but I'll restate it at the end. Mm, yeah, I know, I know. You guys are like feeling all emotional. The voice is so smooth. <sighs> I was gonna go on X Factor, but I thought, you know, that's that's not fair. Like games like guys like James Arthur and that, they need a chance, you know? I have a mute button for you now. <laughs> it's not it's not I don't even have to turn it off, it's one button press and you're done. Hey James, I didn't realise you See, he's gone. That's a wrap. <laughs> oh god. Wow! Yo, who's this guy? Maybe it wasn't Gandhi that I saw on stream. I think they got the names wrong, James. Wow, this this guy is completely random and absolutely kicking FSP's ass. Oh my goodness, what is... Nice. <laughs> Don't ultra. Good. Super. What? What, what, what the... <laughs> what is this? This relentless rush down pressure, you can't deal with it. <laughs> and the psychic, sorry. <laughs> oh, the best hit can for sure you've ever seen. <laughs> oh, goes to the EX just to make sure. What is... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the whiff jump in to the cross bit fireball. <laughs> <laughs> FSP is completely. <laughs> FSP is completely. I, I want to say mind effed right now. I can't oh! I can't he beats the dive kick out with a crouching light punch. Oh, wake it's, up the X fireball. This Ryu is insane. <laughs> Come on. What? what, what? <laughs> FSP needs to stop trying to play a pre active game and just play a reactive game against this kind of player. Oh goodness! Oh no, ah, please no! Please, please no! Please no. Why did he put? Oh good, good grief! Jump! Oh, oh wow! What? Oh. Why is that working? No, oh my lord! <laughs> oh, oh that's fantastic! This is brilliant! This is so insane! Why can't we get more players like this winning? <laughs> No! Psychic! <laughs> okay. Just wait. Just, just wait. Just sense Look, there you go. Don't oh. go for tight links against this guy. Psychic true. Oh my goodness. Just empty jump and let him reversal, please. Oh. What on earth? Come on, FSB. Just hold down back and relax. Relax! Oh my goodness, amazing psychic play there <laughs> from Gandhi. No meter here for Rufus. You can sweep that! Wow. He's still in it. Okay, good block. And he's starting to adjust now to um, Gandhi's style. Fantastic first game though, Gandhi. Thank you so much for that, Gandhi. You made my day. <laughs> 
Oh, oh man, that was brilliant. <laughs> oh, what a read! He doesn't throw, so just relax. He's not done a single throw. There you go. FSP is starting to realize what he's up against now. No he's starting to block the, the jump market crouch from him. J J James, 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 can we get, you got to get a different game on after this one. Please. There's only so much our, our lovely stream monsters can endure. I feel like that guy on Boomerang we were watching last night. That guy got fired on the spot. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is fabulous. <laughs> Nice. Uh, air to air. This reminds me of that guy you get in an arcade jump back in. What on earth? Crouch, I it? would not be doing this. I wouldn't even be doing <laughs> two frame links against this guy. I just. Why is this so? Why is this so close? <laughs> why can't he anti air? Oh, stop it! <laughs> oh goodness me! Anti air, no, man. You can punish the sweet man. <laughs> He's he's like he's in bits mentally. Like. He's gonna lose this round. Just ang oh. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> Just anti air, man. You know what? We're laughing, but this is one of the most important things you need to learn if you want to play this game competitively. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How to deal with these sort of players, like because you can really lose your cool. I shouldn't even be laughing. It's so bad. I'm sorry. Oh, stop Please. trying to re-jump. Except my... Hold on, he can, he can actually win this. <laughs> oh my god, he can he's win. He's at match point right now. He's at match point right now. Ultra! Oh, oh my god, FSP, man. Please. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh god, he's getting what it jumped. <laughs> the throw. <laughs> Ultra. There you yes. go. There you go. Come on. Now don't try and do anything too tricky. Just bait the DP. Yeah, just wait. He's not gonna throw you. Just wait. You can just hold down back. He's so scared that he's walking back. Logan. Hey! There you go. <laughs> An anti-air. Come on. Come on, FSP. Come on, man. He's not used to. To be fair to FSP, it's not him. I'm laughing at. Not at all. Let's get that clear. I'm not laughing at anyone actually. But what, what, what he's saying is he's not used to playing offline. And this is one thing a lot of on, online players need to realize. It's really important to learn a skill as well. Like That's a skill in itself. Playing offline in a live, with a live crowd making noise is a lot more pressurizing than playing at home with your freaking bedroom and your box of shorts. You know, he hasn't got hardly any links. He's really feeling the pressure. Here. I hope and he the doesn't do as well, like this guy is mashing DP oh for his goodness. life in between everything. So. He's trying to just play oh properly. My. He's what, trying what? to he's trying to play properly against this guy, and it's not it's it's not the way to go. Look, and he could lose. He could actually lose. Oh my god, ultra! <laughs> that would have been ultra, but he doesn't know about that. Oh my goodness! Just bait, bait the team! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Gandhi. For clarity, the bottom right is Gandhi. The top right is FSP, the Rufus player. The point is, your opponent can play an incredibly silly game, but if you don't adapt and punish the silly game they're playing, you won't win. The Rufus player clearly believes and probably does think, does really, deserve to win the set. Being a more practiced player who doesn't do silly things that Gandhi does, but he doesn't punish the things that Gandhi does that are silly. Let's him get away with a lot, and he's trying to play a game against what he expects from a Ryu player. Adaptation and even more so anti-airing properly are hugely important. To round things out here, I want to take a quick moment to mention some other 2D fighting games that are similar but very different to what we've talked about here. Marvel vs. Capcom 3 on the right is a very high-octane combo-based game, and Guilty Gear Exert on the left has a similar high combo focus while also introducing the concept of burst, the ability to break free of your opponent's combo. 
Games similar to Guilty Gear here are sometimes referred to as air dashers or anime games, and have a much different take on jumping than Street Fighter in that you can block in the air, or double jump and change your trajectory, or dash forwards or backwards while in the air. Marvel also features, features air dashing, but lacks some of the other hallmarks of anime games like Burst. Marvel and anime games have more lenient timing to successfully combo, usually, and have a much, much faster game speed than Street Fighter 4. So maybe give those games a look, too, if they appeal to you. To close things out, I wanted to plug Buckeye Land, the club I'm part of that, this, that put this presentation together. We put on gaming tournaments over the school year with our fighting game tournament next planned for March 28th, 2015. If you'd like to join in on helping plan these events or even spe spearheading your own event to, or lecture with games you're passionate about, we have planning meetings on Tuesdays at 7.30 at Anderson Hall currently or the Central Ca Classrooms building. Drop myself or Tyler Whitlock a line on Facebook or through our school emails at Beatty.14 at BuckeyeMail.OSU.edu and Whitlock.43 at OSU.edu. And we'll get you into our planning group on Facebook or get you the information on what room we'll be having our next meeting in. Finally, again, I deeply recommend Columbus Fighting Games, who currently meet also on Tuesdays in the basement of Donato's starting at or around 7 p.m. and running into the night, as local play with people you know and seeking advice is the surest way to improve. We also now even have an arcade in the area, which is focused on fighting games, though they also have a host of shoot 'em ups in classic cabinets, called The Dojo at 1362 East 5th Avenue. At the time of the writing, they've had a couple of soft openings to test the waters of their equipment, and having gone to them, I can assure you that the arcade experience with fighting games is truly fantastic. And getting to play games you don't normally play, they both really help you learn. The model they went with when I went was $5 to get in, and then every machine was free play for the whole night. But since they allowed alcohol, you had to have an ID to prove you were at least 18. Point is, there were lots of places to go and seek matches out with people you can talk to and seek feedback from, and in the process, get good. Thank you very much for watching my presentation. Following now, I'm going to close the presentation and demonstrate a couple things in trading mode on PC Ultra Street Fighter 4. Um, just a couple light things about the characters I recommended, demonstrate a few concepts. Okay, and here we are in Street Fighter 4. Um, I'm just going to go into training mode and demonstrate a couple things that I had wanted to just sort of give a light look at just in case you didn't want to go looking for another video about some of the general concepts about Ryu, Balrog, and Guile. I just figured I'd show them off at a low level here, and then if you need some more clarity, you can look up some of the tutorials for doing some of these basic concepts I'm going to show off. Do note that my game has had some mods applied to it for the user interface, interface and some of the sound, um, but obviously these changes don't actually affect the gameplay in any way. Man, are you ready for this? Next location is... Go for Broke! Fight! I'm also using Ryu as a training dummy to beat up on, because Ryu's very average, and very few things, if any, for your character, pretty much no matter who it is, are going to like work on Ryu and then not work on a lot of other people. Uh, he's just a very average hitbox, average character, good for testing stuff out when you're just practicing general stuff for your character. So, first to talk about the Shoryuken input really quick, I just want to talk about a couple things that you could do to make that input easier if it's messing with you. So what you're looking for is this. Shoryuken! Forward, down, down, forward. That's all the game's looking for. Those three arrows, that's it. Now, what you can do if this is messing with you and you can't quite get it right is you can treat it as forward and then a full quarter circle forward and that's fine. So like this. As you can see I go to forward and I finish a whole quarter circle forward but the input buffer, the amount of time I have to do the motion is so long that the game is okay with that. And then of course you have, as I mentioned, you can just sort of mash this. You mash down, for, down forward and down and it'll always come out. That's a shortcut that's available to you for that input. It's really convenient too because Ryu has a has a combo where he starts at Crouching Fierce, that button, and then he can do short you can after, so like this. And it's really easy to mash that out with that shortcut. Now, the primary thing I wanted to talk about was Ryu's FADC into his Ultra 1. Just to show off what it's like, 
and demonstrate, even if you aren't playing Ryu, I highly recommend giving this FADC a try because it can help introduce you to FADCs. It's not very hard. It's not like super duper easy or anything either. It's not super rain dead or something, but you have a lot of time to do this FADC and I'll demonstrate that. But one thing though, if you're practicing on ultra, which you should be, um, this wouldn't be true for some previous versions, but you can't FADC reuse fierce uppercut. So if I try, oops, that was down fierce, my bad. That would have been a valid FADC input, but you just can't FADC that button. It's because it deals so much damage, it was sort of a nerf to Ryu that he can no longer FADC that and get his Ultra 1 off of it because it would deal a lot of damage, um, which is a little silly in retrospect now, but that's the way things are. So you have to use Jab or Strong Shoryuken. And I'll demonstrate, first of all, what you shouldn't do. Whoops. So that is too fast. So that's how much time you have to do this FADC. You can go too quickly and miss. So you want to be very careful that you don't freak out and do it too quick, but also just keep that in mind that you have quite a bit of time to do this FADC. You have a lot of time to learn each step, a lot of time to think about what you're doing and get that dash out correctly. So let's show it properly. And that should catch just fine. So that's Ryu's Ultra 1. Um, it's just uppercut, quickly focus attack, and dash right away. And then you want to wait a moment and do the Ultra 1. So you have time to do those two quarter circle forwards if you're a beginner and that's, that's something that's a little bit difficult for you. Now, one other thing I want to show up, hopefully you can hear it. Um, there are a lot of tutorials for, I mentioned plinking at the end and how I wanted to demonstrate just the sound it makes because I use a fight stick. Um, you can look up tutorials that will show you plinking and show you like a hand cam. Again, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to show a hand cam, which would be very useful for this concept. But if you have a fight stick, just the sound that, that plinking makes is very distinct and you'll hear it in any other tutorial, but I thought I'd just sort of demonstrate it. Whoops. Like that. That sort of double clicking noise. Because you're hitting the second button a sixtieth of a second after the first, more or less. So, get used to that sound if you're using a fight stick. If you're not using a fight stick, unfortunately, it's very hard if you're using an Xbox 360 gamepad or something like that. It's really hard to plink on that controller. Basically when you see players like Smug the Beast or other examples of players who play on pad and do really precise stuff, um, there's a player named Zeus who is a Vega player. He also plays on a pad and does really precise one frame stuff. Most of the time they just, you, it's just almost, it's very hard to plank on pad. So they just sort of don't a lot of the time. Even though the links are one frame, they just sort of do it and they just know the timing well enough. So it's not impossible to do that, it just takes a lot of practice. This is just sort of a, a helper that's available to you if you use Fight Stick. Whoops, we go to character change and I'll talk about Balrog. <clears throat> oh man, are you ready for this? This battle is about to explode. There's a couple things to talk about with Balrog. I really wanted to focus on his Ultra 1 juggle. So we're going to try and show off how to do that combo correctly. Okay. So that's one way to do it. It's sort of the easier way. I messed up a little. But what I wanted was what the input stream showed. Which is when you're doing Balrog's Ultra 1. He... Each of those five hits will either be an uppercut or a straight. And whether you're holding a punch or a kick button determines that. Kicks are uppercuts, punches are straights. So when you're juggling like that, after you've hit them with a headbutt, you would like to get as many hits as possible and do as much damage as possible. And to do that, you need to like sort of manipulate how they're falling by alternating punches and uppercuts. So what I wanted there was uppercut, punch, uppercut, punch, uppercut. 
I believe the last hit is always an uppercut, but I'd have to I'd have to check that. I don't play Balrog. But the idea is by doing that the opponent falls in such a way on you that you hit them a maximum number of times. Now what happened in what I just demonstrated was another possibility that you can do, which is uppercut, punch, and then three uppercuts. Meaning, although I didn't do it quite right, what you can do is you can just hold kicks. You can do kick, punch, kick, and just hold it. And it does a tiny bit less damage. Like, I'll try and demonstrate it the right way. It does like eight more damage to do it this way. So it's not a big deal. Very small amount of damage. But it is a little bit more. Ooh, I messed that up big time. Try one more time. Oh. Anyway, no big deal. So, the other thing I've been trying to demonstrate in these examples I'll try and show it off one more time, and hopefully we'll get the juggle right this time, too. Whoops. Oh, and I'll try and show off one other concept as well. This is actually a good thing. You can go really late. Ooh! Ooh, okay. That's rare. So, what I showed there was pretty much the lowest point where you won't catch Ryu. You can catch Ryu very, very late, as you've as you've probably noticed in some of these, when the Ultra freezes the screen, Ryu sometimes won't even be like on the screen and I'll still catch him. You have a lot of time to do the Ultra 1 input after you've hit the headbutt. So do not sweat doing that. It's very, very lenient. I actually did succeed in going too late, which is rare. There it is. So. I couldn't quite show off what I wanted to, but we'll move on. So what I wanted to do, I just don't play Balrog, so this is something I'm very unused to doing. But after you finish that Ultra, since your opponent was hit by an Ultra, they're on the ground for a guaranteed amount of time. They can't quick stand. So what you'll see Balrog players do, like PR Balrog, after they finish that attack, they're holding back the entire time. They're doing the Ultra because holding the, the direction you're holding doesn't matter. And when they're done, they'll do something like they'll hold down all punches once they're done, and then they'll like do an uppercut. And then, oops, then you let go of the all punches button and you do a turnaround punch. And they do that because you get a little bit of meter for whiffing those two specials and also get close to your opponent while they were going to be on the ground anyway. So it's a good habit to get into if you play Balrog. Once you've finished the ultra, you just sort of you're, you're holding like down back or whatever the whole time and you start holding all punches or all kicks and then whichever one you're not holding you push like the light version of that of that other set of buttons and use your back charge and get dashing up or dashing straight whichever so another thing i wanted to show is that you can also juggle his super so that time you notice once i eventually got it that I do the super and then I just hold kicks. And that's actually the maximum amount of damage that you get from that juggle. You just hold down kicks and you do all uppercuts and the last hit is a straight no matter what you do. But when you do it like that, you get the maximum amount of damage. You don't have to alternate kicks and punches or anything. So it's pretty easy to do it that way. And it's also very safe where Borog could also, if he really wanted, do something like this. to do his super, uh, but that's pretty scary because you have to hit the dashing straight, um, and you might have to, you know, confirm that very quickly in your head, and it might be a little frightening to commit to that much when the headbutt confirm is much slower and gives you a lot of time to think about, oh, I'm hitting him, I can do this now. One other thing I want to show off is how chains mess up the headbutt. So I've got down charge, and I'm going to chain together the jabs and shorts, and the headbutt won't come out. Right there. So as you can see, I'm going really quick, which is causing these buttons to chain together, and my headbutt won't come out even though the, the input's correct. Ooh, also, I don't believe I mentioned this. When you're doing this confirm, it has to be fierce headbutt. The other two versions don't reach.
Whoops. Okay, that time I didn't chain it. But you get the idea. So, it's tempting for new players to see that the three hits, the three initial light hits are comboing, and think, oh, I'm doing it right. So why won't the headbutt come out? If they're comboing, I must be doing the timing correctly. And they learn a timing where they're chaining the hits, which is bad. So, if it's happening to you, just slow down the jabs in the short. Take, like, just calm down and take some time in training mode to learn a slower tempo for doing those hits, and the headbutt will come out. I believe that's all I wanted to talk about for Balrog, so now let's talk about Guile. There's only one thing I want to talk about about oh, Guile. Man, are you ready for this? And that's confirming into his Ultra 2, which is the big confirm. I have been shown that you can apparently theoretically do this with Ultra 1 as well. Next location is... But I've never seen a high-level Guile player do it Go in a real match. Broke. They've always taken Fight. Ultra 2. Oh, I'm accidentally using an alternate for costume for Guile. No big deal, though. So, this is difficult. If you're totally new to this game and you're starting out and you're picking Guile... I would recommend not focusing on this technique because this is quite frustrating to learn, particularly for a new player. So what we're going to do is we're going to do flash kick, which is up in kicks, and sort of like Balrog's Ultra 1, we're going to hold back the whole time, but the difference with Guile is we have to dash forward to catch our opponent with Ultra 2. So I'm going to show off really quick that even though the input for Ultra 2 is charge back, forward, back, forward, we can dash and make it part of the input. So we can dash forward and the game works with us and I'll demonstrate that. Whoops. Nope, too much. Right there. So you see I start from back, I start from down back and then I go up to back and then I dash forward and then hit back forward. The game says that's okay. The game is willing to work with charge characters on these sort of long inputs because it makes stuff like what we're going to do possible, otherwise it wouldn't be if it were really rigid about the inputs for these. Um, you can do a similar thing with the Delta input actually, and though I haven't tried it, I suspect that's how Guile's FADC and Ultra 1 works, because it's something DJ can do. Um, if you ever look into playing DJ maybe, he has a combo where he does EX Machine Gun Upper, dashes forward, and then completes the Delta input for his Ultra 2, which is really confusing, but when you see a player do it, they can sort of show you what they're doing to uh, get that to happen, and it works. Now anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to flash kick, we're going to focus cancel it, dash forward, and do Ultra 2. Now this is pretty difficult, at least I think so, I don't play Guile though. I'm going to show it off and probably mess it up a bunch of times, so bear with me a little. So when you're practicing this, you're going to accidentally backdash a whole lot. It's something I do a bunch. There we are. So, I'm going to cut out a lot of failed attempts. It may slightly give the illusion that I didn't spend a long time here. But that's what you're looking for. And it's very frustrating to do. Trust me. It will take quite a while of practice to get this if Guile is your character of choice. I would almost go so far as to say when you're first starting out, if you were a total beginner, don't focus on this right away. And I would almost recommend just take Ultra 1 and try to use it as an anti-air instead. But, but learn this eventually. It's still important for you to have this in your pocket as something you can do. But don't let it distract you from learning everything else. Now, other bad stuff that can happen. You might have noticed that when I did it, I let Guile pause and start to charge up the focus attack, where in the Ryu example, I didn't do that. I just dashed right away. He just flashes yellow and dashes. With Guile's Ultra 2 cancel like this, if you dash right away and do the Ultra 1, I'm not going to show it because it would probably take me ages to do it wrong properly. But if you go too fast, your opponent falls behind you. And you still do the Ultra 1, the direction, or the Ultra 2, the direction you were facing, and they just, it just doesn't touch them at all. And it's very bad. It's a big waste. So you have to sort of let Guile wind up the focus attack for a moment 
just so that you pause long enough that you don't mess up dashing forward and doing the ultra too fast. Uh, with that, though, that's basically everything that I wanted to touch on for these three characters. Um, again, if you have any more questions, I highly recommend looking on YouTube for tutorials for more in-depth stuff about doing this stuff with these characters and hand cameras, stuff like that, to help you better understand it. Um, but if you still have questions, please address them in the YouTube comments or message the account hosting this video directly. I should hopefully get back to you, at least with somewhere where you could go to answer your question if I can't answer it myself. Uh, with that, though, we're all done here. Thank you very much for coming out and watching this video. I hope it's been of some use to you somewhere. And I wish you all the best in your pursuit of getting good.